All right, well, I might get started and then people can just continue to gradually join us. So welcome everyone to our second session of the Supporting Diverse Workforces series. My name is Sarah Walker and I work in the sector development team here at QCOS and I've also got my colleague Nina online um, assisting me in delivering this webinar today. Before we get into things today, I just wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on today, the Yuggera and Turrbal peoples, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. QCOS thanks First Nations peoples for the gift of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and we are committed to walking alongside First Nations peoples and working towards representation, Makarada and treaty. I would also like to further extend that respect to any First Nations peoples online with us today, um, and would also like to encourage you all to use the chat function to let us know which traditional lands you're dialing in from today as well. So thank you so much again for joining us for our second session today. This will be on the topic of how to write a job ad that gets hits. And um, for those who aren't aware, Supporting Diverse Workforces is a five part webinar series aimed at supporting community service organisations to develop their human resources capability. And the series will cover the many aspects of attracting, supporting and retaining a diverse workforce. Um, we would like to thank the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training who have funded this program of work through their Growing Workforce Participation Fund. So just some quick housekeeping before we jump in. Um, you will receive a copy um, of the slides today. Um, that will come to you in a post event email and um, you'll also get access to an online resource library as well. And the format of the session today will be um, the first half um, will be a presentation by Christine Mudavanu and Lisa Stockwell. Um, they'll be presenting some information on how to craft a position description and an effective job ad. And in the second half of the session today, we'll be joined by panelists who will be sharing their own experiences in relation to inclusive recruitment fact, uh, practices. So I'd just like to welcome um, Christine from Utano Global and Lisa from Camben HR Consulting to deliver the first part of the session. Um, just to give you some background into Lisa and Christine, um, Christine is the Principal Consultant of Utano Global, um, a diversity, equity and inclusion consulting firm and is the Director for Queensland at Migrant Women in Business, a national social enterprise supporting entrepreneurial migrant and refugee women. Christine champions human transformation by fostering inclusive cultures within organisations. Lisa is the principal consultant of Camben HR Consulting and is the lead facilitator of a boutique DEI training and consulting company. With more than 25 years of experience, Lisa is driven by the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion to enable both leaders and team members to provide the best service to their clients. So as we go through the presentation today, if you've got any questions in relation to Lisa and Christine's presentation, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat um, and they'll be able to answer those in the um, part following their presentation. So now I'll hand over to Lisa and Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. OK, so as Sarah said, today we'll be talking about uh, position descriptions, job ads, and then we're going to do a bit more of a deep dive into um, how to best recruit for targeted roles and also accessibility considerations as well. OK, uh, so what actually is a position description and a job ad? Uh, position descriptions are the part where people go, oh, I don't want to write one of those. Uh, and the job ad is the bit that people rush to to, to get that bit done. Um, it's really important though to make sure that you've done that groundwork. You need to have a really well crafted position description first. So then you can actually make sure you have a good solid job ad. So let's explore what we mean by position descriptions and how to actually make sure that you've got an uh, inclusive one. So writing position descriptions is never a job people get excited to do. So what we often see is one of three things, uh, either a position description listing every possible thing that this role might possibly need, uh, every skill, every qualification, every experience, everything that they'll require to do this job extraordinarily well. It's an absolute shopping list. Um, or perhaps the position description has been based on the most recent incumbent. Um, whatever that person does, whatever that person's skill sets or qualifications are, that's what goes into the position description. Or finally, 
we see organisations that have a boilerplate PD template. Uh, so, you know, the top and the bottom is pretty much exactly the same and you change a little bit of information in the middle uh, and that will do the job. Unfortunately, one size does not fit all uh, and nor are you actually looking for a unicorn. So, this is what I mean by a boilerplate PD example. So one organisation I've done some work with recently has this list of required skills in every position description that they have. Um, quite literally, if they are looking for an aerospace engineer or a receptionist, th these are in both of those position descriptions. Now, I'm not sure about you, but generally speaking, when I'm looking for a receptionist, I really want them to have much better interpersonal skills than what I'm necessarily looking for in my aerospace engineer. The aerospace engineer position description also has 26 bullet points for those roles responsibilities, covering everything from maintaining a clean and tidy workspace through to investigating all significant defects in the uncrewed aviation systems. So again, What's actually important for this role? What are the critical parts of the role that you're thinking about? Not every single possible thing that possibly might fall into this job at some point in time. It just makes it too unflexible and too unwieldy. There are four key things you need to be making sure that you include in your position description. The majority of roles in Australia are covered by an award. So make sure you spend that time to work out what award actually is covering this particular role. Once the person has actually joined uh, and is doing the role, sometimes that is when the actual classification will change depending on the level of uh, skills and experience that they bring, but at least make sure you've got that award um, identified correctly in the first place. What is the purpose and the span of the role? Um, the key responsibilities, not every responsibility, but what are the key responsibilities? And then what are the skills, experience and attributes required? Again, you're not looking for a unicorn. You're also not looking for someone who can do this job at 110% on day one. Job descriptions really do serve as a detailed blueprint of what is expected for the role. It outlines those duties, responsibilities and objectives. It's actually the foundation of the recruitment process. Uh, it guides the creation of the job ads and it helps to match the right candidates with the right roles. And having a carefully crafted job description can actually promote diversity and inclusion by making sure you're using a language that is welcoming to all candidates and by clearly stating the organisation's commitment to these values. And choice of language is something that Christine is going to really look at in a lot more detail uh, later on. Down the track, your position description will serve as a benchmark for performance evaluation. It sets those clear standards and expectations for both employees and managers. It can actually aid in career development and planning by outlining the required skills and competencies for different roles, and it helps employees to understand the path for growth within an organisation. They can really see what is required for each of those different roles in different areas as well. Finally, by having that really clear definition of roles, responsibilities and qualifications, you're reducing your risk of discrimination claims by ensuring compliance with employment laws and regulations. We'll actually include a position description template tip sheet uh, as a resource for you after this presentation. So some things to think about with position descriptions. It's recommended that you update your position descriptions at least every two years as roles actually evolve over time. What we find is they tend to get bigger or more advanced. And what we know is that roles that are typically held by men are reviewed more often than roles that are held by women. And these reviews often result in jobs being revalued and placed in a higher job band. We also know that the more requirements you have for a role, the more people start to self-select out. But this self-selection isn't evenly distributed. What researchers have found is that if a man is looking at a job ad and can do, say, three of the five criteria and is interested in the job, he'll apply for it. If a woman looks at a job ad and meets three of the five criteria, she won't apply. So you're already missing out on, on this group of people. So while I'm talking about job ads here, the decision around what is considered an essential criteria 
and what's simply desirable starts right back at the writing of your position description. Let me give you an example. Kimberly Clark, you know, makers of toilet paper and also the, all the important things like that, hired no women onto their production floor in 2019. So they had a look at their recruitment processes and actually realised they had some biases built into their recruitment process. So some of those things were their ads actually had a shopping list of skills required. And one of those was a forklift licence. They also didn't provide flexible work options. So they changed their ads and they now provide training for forklift driving once the person has joined the company and they also provide flexible work options. Interestingly, more men than women in their existing workforce have taken up those flexible work options. By 2021, more than 50% of their hires are now women. So as you can see, was it essential to have a forklift licence? No, it wasn't. It's something that you're able to learn and to do. And make sure, of course, that you are reviewing everything through that diversity lens rather than just this is what we've always done. Make sure that your position description allows for consideration of transferable skills. These might be coming from volunteer work, work in the home, or maybe it's provided someone with a level of competency equivalent to a certain qualification or a certain number of years of experience. Finally, if you do require a certain number of years of experience, think about what you're really asking for here. A person might be in the same job for 10 years, but really only have one year's worth of experience just done 10 times over. Another person might have three years of experience, but because of the variety of work given to them, the mentoring and the on-the-job training that they've received, perhaps that's actually the equivalent of five years worth of experience. Try to really articulate what you mean so you don't automatically exclude otherwise highly qualified individuals. Okay, so let's take all of this now and put it into how you then are going to write your job ads. And Christine is going to take you through that. Oops, it helps if I unmute my mic. Thank you very much, Lisa, um, for that. So the job ads, as Lisa said, uh, is usually what people find the most exciting because then you're getting out there, you're communicating, and you're letting people know what it is that you are looking for. But what are some of the key components that you need to make sure that you have in your job um, advertisement in order for it to uh, be eye-catching. Remember, you are competing in a very tight job market. People have a lot of options, and I don't know if you've been on Seek lately to see how many other jobs um, look like the job that you're advertising out there. It is a very competitive environment for employers out there to attract the right kind of talent, so you want to make sure that your job ad stands out. So uh, for you to do that, there are five key components that you need to focus on. The information that you provide about your organization and the team. You need to be really clear about what the role entails. Ambiguity leads people to switch off and just move on to the next role. You need to be clear what skills, experience and attributes are actually required for the role. As Lisa specified, you're not looking for a unicorn. You're not looking for um, the skills that the previous person brought into that role, or maybe you're looking for some aspects of that. But you really need to think about, well, what is required in order for the job to be exercised in a way that is efficient, in a way that is productive uh, for uh, the needs of the organisation? You need to provide information on the employee benefits. What is the value proposition? If I'm looking for a job, I want to know if I'm bringing all of these skills and attributes to this job that you're asking for, well, what am I getting out of it? So make sure that you're clear on what those benefits are. A lot of our job ads aren't, and people just simply move on because they can't work out, well, what's in it for them? And last but not least, and very important, a lot of the times people forget to tell people how to actually apply for the job. It may seem like this is common sense, but the number of ads when you look and you review um, that simply just do not provide that information or don't provide it clear enough and the candidate has to go looking for it. Again, that is a reason for a candidate to skip over your advertisement and just move on to the next one.
So if you look at some, if you look at what you're competing against, I mentioned how uh, competitive the job market is. There are over 220 community services ads that are posted for Brisbane and Seek in the last seven days. And nearly every ad um, has the word passionate, caring, fixed term, part-time, or casual looking through, um, sorry, um, woven through the job advertisement. So if you are crafting your job ads, chances are these words are already in um, in those and your job ad is looking no different to a job ad that's being advertised by another organisation. So if you look at um, these two advertisements, and these are actual examples of advertisements that we have um, clicked on, based on what I talked about in slide 11, about the five components that really help you to identify and make your job ad stand out. If you look at the first one, that's for a disability support worker um, working for the for an aged and disability support organization. Um, you know, there's a bit of information about the role. But if you look at the bottom one, that's a very clear job ad in the sense that you've got the hourly rate specified, you've got the specific area within Brisbane, not just a general geographical area because Brisbane is quite large. You've got Ashgrove in there. You've also got very specific requirements around the job itself. Work um, on a flexible 24-7 roster, um, open to experience and those entering um, the industry, casual and part-time roles. So that really allows people to know that, okay, if I can only do part-time hours, because I've got other commitments. I'm, um, I'm seen as uh, a potential candidate for this role if I'm just returning to, uh, to the workforce or maybe I'm segueing into a new career. Um, this this organisation is, uh, is open to that. And also then you've got the Shads Awards covered in there. So I know clearly from a remuneration perspective which award I, I, I fall under and how I will be remunerated. So when you're um, crafting a job ad, you really need to start with a statement that leads with your organization's mission values to attract like-minded candidates. As I alluded to before, you are in a very competitive environment and every single industry at the moment is plagued with labor shortages. And in particular, the community services sector, um, there are some serious shortages um, in that space. So you wanna make sure that you're leading with a very strong statement about what is the value proposition um, with regards to your organization. You want to use simple, inclusive language to outline key responsibilities and qualifications. If your organization has a diversity statement, you want to explicitly state this out so that people know that you are welcome diverse applicants and you demonstrate your, uh, your commitment to being an inclusive organization. You need to highlight the benefits and growth within your organization. Detail the benefits, professional development opportunities and career advancement pathways. There's some people who will join organizations simply because they're offering them a future opportunity. And some people may even take a lower paying position um, in order for them uh, to enter an organization because they see potential for growth. I know I've made such decisions uh, when developing my career to join organizations which offered me a pathway rather than organizations which just offered me a destination, which was where I was at that point in time. Use an accessible format. Opt for clear, easy to read fonts, bullets and headings to ensure readability. Again, the real estate out there with job ads is highly, highly competitive. If I am struggling, you've used like five point aerial caliber font that I can't read. I'm scrolling over that, um, that ad immediately and moving on. Because if you as an organization can't take the time to have clarity, I don't, I won't be spending more time trying to scroll through your ad because there are other people who've taken that time and therefore I'll simply move on. Um, include a clear call to action. Guide candidates on how to apply and what the next steps 
are. A lot of the times people, as I alluded to earlier, just simply forget to put the call to action. You know, you can put all of these um, wonderful words about, you know, how brilliant you are, incorporate your diversity statement. But if you don't tell me what to do next, I'm kind of left in suspense. And again, I'd like, oh, well, great ad, nice to know, but I don't know what to do. And I'm not going to invest the time at that point in time to find out. I may simply just again, move on. Provide contact information. You'll be surprised if you just do a search on Seek, on smart jobs, how difficult it is to find contact information or the appropriate contact information. And don't give just a general reception number, just actually give contact information for somebody who can actually provide information about the role. The amount of times you phone an organization and somebody just doesn't even know what you're talking about, and then you have to be put through to another person and another person. Again, you've already got a candidate who's got a lot of options annoyed. Um, so make sure you provide not only the contact information, but the correct contact information for somebody who can actually add value and be able to answer candidates' questions about that job ad. The language that you use within your job ads is really, really important. Now, for myself, in the work that I do uh, in diversity, equity and inclusion, ensuring that language that you use can make the difference between getting um, somebody interested in having a conversation with you or completely putting somebody off. So different words conjure up different images, which uh, can bias the people that apply. So a lot of these words, you have seen them before, and a lot of you have actually used them in and continue to use them in job uh, in job ads without necessarily maybe even being aware of what biases they may be conjuring up in potential applicants. So, for example, words like competitive, fearless uh, and enforcement are very masculine uh, toned and can turn off um, potential female applicants, transparent, collaborative and supportive, again, are feminine toned and can turn off um, masculine um, male applicants. And in the community services sector and the worker bee population, uh, you're looking to um, a lot of sectors are looking to, uh, you know, to diversify and get more males to do things um, within uh, support worker roles uh, and other roles which have traditionally been feminine. It pays to have a look at the wording and the way that those um, advertisements are being put out. Words like energetic, ninja, fun loving have a youth tone um, because they conjure up that energy. Responsible, uh, strategic, mentor have an elder tone. A tip, use the MIT Inclusive Hub um, free text so and data pe um, people resource. So MIT has developed this resource, which um, is free uh, to use. There's also a paid version of it where you can simply just put your job ad through and um, it can highlight for you um, the different um, words and the different tones and the biases that these different tones uh, could use. So if you're not aware of that resource, I would suggest, you know, uh, looking it up and we will, uh, and that information will be provided in your tip sheet and again just running your job ads through that and seeing you know have I probably missed the mark with the inclusivity of my language am I unintentionally excluding candidates um, that I would want to apply for this role so let's take a little bit of um a deeper dive into the actual job ads and let's look at some uh, at some of the language and really look at some specific words uh, and what they mean. So if you look at this, this is um, a job ad and what can be improved in this job ad. So this job ad includes uh, gendered language, it also includes additional emphasis on robust uh, track record, strong physical, mental stamina, um, competitive spirit. It's requiring certain years um, of experience, and this could mean people um, returning to um, the workforce. Apologies, I, I went a little bit ahead um, uh, onto, slide, uh, onto slide 17. So if you look at these two slides, 16 and 17, they really have words that have been highlighted that conjure up certain images um, and may be unintentionally excluding um, certain applicants from the job 
uh, description. And again, running it through that tool that we alluded to earlier on will definitely highlight these words and offer you the opportunity to improve this language. So looking at uh, the next two slides, um, you will see that we now have a job ad that is significantly strengthened. The language is a lot more um, inclusive. We are now appealing to a much broader range of applicants. We have removed some of those words, which would unintentionally in, um, exclude certain demographic groups from even considering um, the application uh, process. And we're now really enacting a lot of the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, statements that we as a sector um, aspire to uh, to have. One of the advantages that the community services sector has is that uh, from a client base, community services sector has the broadest and the most diverse um, set of clientele. And so you find that in terms of the language that is used and the care that is taken in terms of communicating with the client pool and ensuring that, you know, communication is effective, communication is inclusive, communication is efficient, and it's, provi it's provided in a whole range um, of languages, of tools and resources. The sector does that really, really well when it's outward facing. If you apply those same skills, to your job ads, um, you'll find that you will get a lot greater improvement and a lot greater um, engagement with the, the pool of candidates that you have, because these are skills that you already have within, um, within your organization. It's just changing the lens a bit because a lot of these skills you find have been heavily focused on your customer base. But if you turn these around and you focus them on your worker bee population and the people that you're looking to recruit, you'll find that the skills to have an inclusive language and an inclusive approach to your recruitment processes you already have within your organization. So here we've got, so on these two slides, we've got a job ad again that is on Seek and smart jobs, um, job ad one and job ad two. So if we're looking at um, targeting different people, um, we've highlighted here um, the words on, on the slide to show the different demographic groups that the different words are impacting. So the orange um, is really words that are feminine, um, that appeal more to the feminine um, audience in terms of uh, biases. The yellow is more your energetic demographic, um, so people who really identify with that younger um, cohort. The teal is um, your masculine tone language, so independent, self-starter, challenging, unionized, confident, decisive, um, high um, highly unionized, sorry, um, leader, all of those words have strong um, emphasis on the masculine um, tone. Words like experience tend to have more uh, appeal to your uh, mature audience. And if you look on um, the next slide, you'll see that um, we've segmented those um, words for you uh, to help you out in terms of you doing your own checks and your own QAs in terms of the advertisements that you're putting out and having a look at how is your language influencing a certain bias. And you can also use this not just necessarily in a negative way to exclude, but in a positive way to actually include a certain demographic. So you may be really wanting Wanting to have, um, you know, people of a certain generation apply for that job. So then you intentionally um, use those uh, use those words in order for you to actually actively um, attract that demographic group in terms of uh, a candidate uh, pool. So. I'm not sure how many of you within the sector have a diversity 
statement and have inclusive language practices within even the communications that you put on your website, um, I would assume pretty much, you know, a large proportion of the sector would already have some sort of diversity uh, statement, just given the diversity of the clientele, given um, the nature of service delivery, and given the ethos of the majority of the organizations within the sector, a lot of this would come naturally in terms of um, you know, either a thought process or something that if it's not concrete and on your website is something that you're probably thinking about or having conversations um, about. But if you're looking at inclusive language and diversity statement, it's important to prioritize inclusivity and use language that respects um, the diversity of the applicants. Avoid biased terms, which we have discussed previously. Eliminate jargon um, and culturally specific re uh, references that may exclude or deter potential candidates. Emphasize accessibility. State accommodations that are available for candidates with disabilities to ensure that the application process is accessible to all. And accessibility goes beyond just um, the traditional um, definitions around accessibility, we may, which may just include, uh, which may be limited to physical disability. I myself am dyslexic and I am part of the neurodivergent group and some people disclose and other people don't. But in terms of reasonable accommodations and in terms of um, the information that you put out there, there are people who are colorblind. Um, you know, think about all of these reasonable accommodations that you can um, put out so that you do not unintentionally discriminate against candidates who could be eligible for um, the jobs that you're putting out there. You need to craft a strong diversity statement, clearly articulate your organization's commitment to diversity and inclusion, and highlight the value, um, your value propositions and your diverse perspectives. And it's also really good um, to note that your diverse statement should actually be reflective in your principles and your values and what your organization stands for and the experience that your organization, that people who interact with your organization have. Because once people start to see that those things don't don't align, then um, you know, your diversity statement could become a bit in question in terms of it being genuine. So just make sure that you know there is alignment and congruency between what you're putting out as a diversity statement and what you as an organization are actually doing. Actively encourage diverse applications. As um as a sector, you may or may not be aware of the underemployment of people with a disability based on um, huge prejudices and huge biases and assumptions about uh, reasonable accommodations, about accessibilities, which are made um, without necessarily having any science to back it up or without necessarily any data or any inquiries into that. There's huge opportunities to increase the employment rate of people with a disability. Same with people from multicultural um, backgrounds who a lot of the times are underemployed because of the skills recognition framework that doesn't recognize prior experience outside of Australia. Um, and uh, again, older people is another demographic group that is underemployed because corporate sector may not necessarily value um, the same level of experience um, as the community services sector might do. So those are three broad demographic groups that are underemployed within Australia that the sector could take advantage of in terms of addressing a lot of the skill um, shortages that are present within the sector. Review and revise. Um, your, uh, your job ads regularly to reflect current best practice. The language is evolving around diversity, equity and inclusion. The language we were using even 12 months ago um, has changed. You'll find a lot of um, statements now include the word belonging um, in their diversity, equity and inclusion strategy. So there's a B that's been added um, in there, whereas before it was diversity, equity. There's also conversations around people understanding the difference between equity and, um, and equality, the same um, same, 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 and actually providing a lever in order for those who may have been marginalized before to get the same advantage. So, uh, so understand the difference between the terminology and how all of this 
is evolving. Lead by example, showcase your organization's diversity um, initiatives and achievements to illustrate your communication, your commitment to action, and do this more than just cups of tea. Really put out what are you doing as an organization in terms of your commitment? What are your stats in terms of diverse people that you've actually employed? What are some of the accommodations that you've made in order to attract new and different candidates into your organization. So with diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging statements, and I did mention before that the word belonging is um, new, inter relatively new in terms of it being commonly used um, with uh, in the diversity, equity and inclusion space. Um, you don't need to put out a statement that meets every single requirement. The challenge is that organizations think, oh my goodness, I have to be all things to all people. Diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging statements that actually resonate with people clearly articulate um, the organization's mission, who you serve, also who you do not serve, because you're not trying to be all things to all people. Studies have shown that women and people of color are less likely to apply for jobs unless they meet every single qualification. So you want to make sure that, you know, in your diversity, equity and inclusion um, statement, if you're trying to really appeal to that demographic group, what are some of the accommodations that you could put in place um, in terms of the statements that you put out to ensure that you are attracting that demographic group? If you'd like to request adjustments to participate in a recruitment process, is your organization really, really open to that? Let's take a look at Coles and QUT's diversity statements as um, examples. So these are just examples based on what they believe in these organizations. So if you look at the top one, QUT is about creating safe spaces for inclusivity to flourish. Um, they know that diversity is their strength. They, um, if you're curious, uh, and innovative. And if you've heard QUT, they call themselves, uh, you know, the university for the real world. So that is aligned to their innovation and they are the university for technology. And so that's really looking at how they can align that with their diversity, equity and inclusion uh, statement. The bottom one is um, from Coles and they're looking at, you know, flexibility and encouraging their team to work in ways that meet their work life commitments. And probably um, the flexibility comes a lot from, um, you know, the challenges the supermarket industry faced um, during COVID, where there had to be huge pivots and adapting uh, to a completely different environment. The other element, of course, that we need to have in our job ad is the employee value proposition. Um, when people are applying, it's not just a one way street. They're looking for what an organisation can be bringing to them as much as what you are looking for them to be bringing to your organisation. An employee value proposition is so much more than just the hourly rate or the, the annual salary. Um, certainly that is a component of it. Uh, and, you know, if there are bonuses or other financial benefits, um, that is certainly you know, a consideration, but it's also going to be things like what are the leave options or the flexible work options that might be available? Um, a company I do work with, they do a 38 hour week, but it's 8.30 to five with a half hour lunch Monday to Thursday, and then a three o'clock finish on Fridays. Um, and yet that wasn't actually in their job ads. You know, that, that's enormously appealing to a lot of people to have an early finish every Friday. Um, learning and development, mentoring, career development options. So does this role have an opportunity to work with someone who, uh, you know, might be a specialist in the field or you've got a really good training program? Um, is it a really interesting range of work that might be available in this job? People generally like to learn. Um, they like that novelty. So what is it about that role that might be uh, providing some of those things? What is the type of work the employee gets to do? So make it clear, don't use jargon, actually make it pretty clear what the type of work is they get to do. Um, and we're, you know, people are interested in interesting work. So what can we do in that space? How people get to do it as well. 
So what sort of autonomy do they have in being able to choose you know, which task they do first or how they actually do it? Are there opportunities to work with other people, to collaborate with others? Um, is there flexibility in how they actually do their work? And finally, if you have employee resource groups, um, you know, it might be an LGBTQI plus support group or, you know, one for working mums or there's so many different options out there. If you have anything like that, certainly make sure that you mention that in your ad. So what is best practice consideration for um, targeted positions? Now, with targeted positions, these are positions that have been specifically set aside in order to increase a specific cohort within your organization. So you need to understand the target uh, demographic. You need to research the needs and preferences and understand the characteristics and communication preferences of the group that you're targeting. So remember earlier on when we talked about the different kinds of uh, words that you can use uh, to attract different, um, different demographic groups? Um, when you're doing targeted uh, position recruitment, using those, um, you know, uh, using those in abundance is actually encouraged when you're doing targeted positions because you are being very specific about who it is that you're wanting to attract to that job. Now, the Navy and the Army do this are doing this really, really well in the sense that they're really wanting to increase um, the, more females within the armed forces. So you will find that a lot of their targeted ads are targeted um, at uh, at a specific demographic group, at, a, at females of a specific age. Um, they offer, you know, uh, flexible work arrangements for mums. They've got all sorts of uh, languaging in the advertisements that they put out in order for that demographic group to really know and resonate that this advertisement um, is uh, is targeted at them. There's engagement with community leaders and organizations that represent or work closely with the target demographic group, particularly if you're trying to attract a demographic group that has traditionally been um, marginalized. I noticed in the chat, uh, Claudia put uh, Job Access, a free service that supports employees to hire uh, people with a disability. So there is a myriad of organizations that are within the sector that really support those marginalized uh, communities to actually get into employment. So if you're looking at targeted positions that say increase the number of people with a disability within your organization, that maybe increase um, migrant and refugee women or people of non-English speaking backgrounds within your workforces, there's a whole myriad of organizations that are available to you that the sector is actually familiar with that you can work with to actually um, uh, craft a really good targeted uh, position description in order for you to attract that demographic group within your organization. So moving on, um, some of the things that you really need to consider when you're crafting that job advertisement is, um, is make sure that your language is inclusive. It's welcoming. You need to highlight the diversity that you are targeting for. So clearly state your organization's commitment to inclusion. Emphasize your policies. So make sure before you start going out for targeted recruitment that within your organization, you've actually done the work. Um, because there's nothing worse than going out for targeted um positions, but you actually haven't done the work to align your policies and procedures or your organizational environment to ensure that you align with the demographic group of people that you are bringing in. So, for example, if you're increasing the, um, the demographic profile of people with a disability within your organization, make sure you've got a really good accommodations and uh, uh, reasonable accommodations policy. You understand it. Everybody within your organization is aware of how to apply for accommodations when they, uh, when they are required. Uh, so make sure that those things um, align. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where again, what you're recruiting for and your organizational environment and your diversity, equity and inclusion statement are not in alignment and you start to lose credibility with the candidates that are applying from diverse background. Role representation, showcase testimonial or stories from employees within the same demographic group, uh, demonstrating the organization's supporting environment and career growth uh, opportunities.
if you're looking at your ad, you want to make sure that it is accessible. Um, so this is just in terms of the actual hard things that you need to do. So there's the soft things, um, you know, when you are looking at language, making sure all of that is OK. But you need to make sure simple things like people can read um, the advertisement. Make sure that, you know, you can navigate it with a mouse. Most of job ads are seen online. In fact, all job ads are seen online. And so make sure that um, everybody who had, not everybody who has a screen sees things the way you see them. So make sure you run it through um, a good accessibility screen readers. Your Microsoft um, and your Apples have good screen readers that can show you how accessible uh, your document is and how um, how easy somebody else who may have some challenges that you don't have can easily access it. Um, use a font that's readable. Uh, we mentioned it and I gave myself as an example, uh, being a dyslexic, how sometimes, you know, um, I struggle when fonts is too small. I transpose letters quite easily so I could miss certain things or misinterpret something if the font size is not taking, uh, you know, my neurodiversity into uh, consideration. Most people do a lot of things from their mobile phones, so make sure that your application process is accessible in that it allows people to apply using their phone or using their iPad or using a multitude of devices rather than just relying on their computer. Gone are the days where people do the majority of their work on their computer. People are now doing the majority of their work on their mobile phone. Uh, make sure that you match um, your expectations with what the role actually requires. Do you require a cover a, a cover letter addressing selection cr criteria for an entry role? Just make sure there isn't a mismatch there. Again, as Lisa talked about, you know, that cookie cutter version, make sure you're really tailoring the requirements and the effort that somebody must put into the role to apply with what the role actually requires. Allow for a spell check fa functionality and allow people to navigate the application form by using their key board and allow people to use screen readers and other assistive uh, technology. Make sure that the application process is simple. You've got contact, um, uh, contact information. It's also a continuous improvement. So as you as you know, um, as you know better, do better. Make sure that you know as you learn, you're evolving. So the job ad that you did two years ago should not be the same job ad that you're using two years uh, two years later. There should be significant um, improvements, and you should have a feedback mechanism why, where people can be able to give you um, their information. So I might stop there because we're going to move on to our very exciting uh, panel. Thank you so much, Lisa and Christine, for presenting that content. Um, that was um, really, really useful information, I'm sure, for a lot, um, a lot of people online. So thank you so much. So now we'd like to introduce you all to our wonderful panel of guest speakers today. So we've got Claudia Stevenson online. So Claudia works as a professional advisor in the National Disability Recruitment Coordinator Team at Job Access. The NDRC team assists larger larger employers over with over 100 staff to become more disability confident recruiters through offering free 12 month partnerships. Claudia has been with Job Access for over two years now. Prior to this, Claudia has been working in various parts of the disability workforce in allied health, advocacy and housing. They have lived experience as a person with blindness and low vision, but also as a family member of someone with complex disability. Claudia mostly mobilises with the assistance of their guide dog, Poppy, and in their spare time, they're training for the London Marathon. Then we've got Sophia Petrov. So Sophia is the National Manager of Policy and Engagement at Council on the Aging Australia. And Sophia's career has spanned television news production, teaching language, aged and community services, board appointments, senior roles in local government and the community sector as well. As well as managing large teams of staff and large operational budgets in complex environments, Sophia has also worked in smaller organisations with financial and operational restraints. Sophia is also a qualified and experienced workplace and business coach and has worked with many teams and individuals to focus, develop and achieve increased work satisfaction as well as increasing staff engagement. 
And Sophia is really committed to listening to older people and working with them to inform policy development and advocacy. And then our final panelist is Anab Roble. So Anab is a senior leader with extensive experience in human resources, finance and diversity, belonging and inclusion. Anab has 21 years of public services experience and is currently the manager of diversity and inclusion for the Victorian Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Anab migrated to Australia from Somalia 25 years ago, spoke no English when she arrived, and a civil war pre prevented her from accessing education beyond grade five. Anab really enjoys revamping workplace cultures and driving diversity and inclusion initiatives, and she's a strong advocate on disability employment and has shared her lived experience in many forums. Anab is also a proud member of several networks and committees, including the Victorian Public Sector Women of Colour Network, President for the Victoria Public Sector Enablers Network, and is also a member of the Victorian African Communities Committee, providing advice to the Minister for Multicultural Affairs on issues relevant to Victoria's African communities. So we're very excited to have these three wonderful panellists joining us today. Um, and now we're going to get into the various questions that we have for them. So I'll start off with, um, oh, Lisa, would you mind stopping the screen sharing and then we'll um, put the panellists on the screen? Thank you. Um, so we're going to start off with you, Claudia. Um, and Claudia, our first question for you. So you've been with Job Access um, for a couple of years now, and that involves you working with organisations to attract the skills and talents of people with disability. And of course, this um, involves recruitment practices being seen through a disability lens. What are some of the reasonable adjustments organisations can make to ensure the recruitment process in, is inclusive for candidates with a disability? And how can organisations build these into the position description? Um, thanks so much. I just absolutely have to say I just loved the presentations by Christine and Lisa because they absolutely highlight exactly um, where what job access talks about, um, you know, that um, by making the, the process accessible to people with disability, we're actually going to be making the process accessible to everyone. Um, I think before we can even talk about reasonable adjustments, you know, it's really making sure um, that we've really worked out what those inherent requirements are. Um, and I think that came re through really clearly today in both what Christine and Lisa's talked about. They're those things that are really essential to the role. Um, sometimes they don't necessarily even have to be things that are done every day. They might just be things that um, happen occasionally, but they're still, you know, a mandatory requirement uh, for that role. So they're the things that um, we need to think about how things need to be, uh, not how, how things need to be done, but what things need to be done. Um, so, you know, for example, we often use the example of uh, a receptionist needing to make and receive phone calls. Um, so that's often the inherent, you know, an inherent requirement. But, you know, typically we used to think about people needing to hold a telephone receiver in their hand. That's not an inherent requirement. Um, so if we focus on what needs to be done, the how of getting it done is, you know, able to be adjusted. So nowadays, you know, we can provide people um, with telephone headsets so they don't need to hold a phone in their hand and we can use computerised um, telephone systems so that, you know, people with dexterity issues um, or people who may not be able to necessarily hold a phone in their hand can still achieve that requirement of, of using a telephone. Um, as a person who's blind or have low vision, my pet bugbear, of course, is seeing um, must have driver's license as an inherent requirement. Um, and often that can be for a completely office based role where they're never, ever going to need to drive a car, um, not even to go out and get, you know, um, supplies for the office or things like that um, because it's just been in there forever and ever or maybe once upon a time you used to use it as a, um, a you know um, you know a requirement for identification for example so travel is usually the inherent requirement unless of course you know you do need um, to be able to physically drive for example a forklift or something like that then you know that's okay but um, we just need to check every time that we're putting in uh, must have driver's license that that's actually required for the role um, usually having uh, that requirement for travel is the important part and what does that actually look like um, in my previous role I was working for an organization where I'd have to go and visit clients in the community um, and the organization provided cars for all of their staff to be able to attend 
attend appointments. So instead for me, um, because I can't drive, they were able to provide um, taxis, they'd pay for my taxis. Um, some of my colleagues also used, um, we'd also use public transport to attend appointments. Uh, one of my colleagues um, used a, a bike to attend a appointments where they could. So, you know, there are all ways that we can achieve those travel requirements without necessarily being able to drive. Um, for country or interstate trips, for example, I'd often go with another colleague. Um, now under, you know, NDIS, there's the possibility of even hiring support workers to, to make those travel requirements, um, you know, possible. So, yeah, that's, I think, um, the thing that's really important is really being clear about what those inherent requirements are. And just because, as you know, it's been said, just because that the job's been done a certain way for a very long period of time doesn't mean that we can't, that needs to continue to be done in the same way. So um, just being open about, you know, what's, what's, what's really needed in the role, I think is really important. Um, and just a quick plug for job access. Um, we've got some fantastic resources available on our website. We also have that telephone number 1800 464 800 that you can ask uh, any questions about hiring people with disabilities um, or making reasonable adjustments in the workforce. Um, we've, we're, we're a really untapped resource um, that's available to you. And um, my team, we work with large organisations. Um, we have a little bit of trouble if people get funding through NDIS for their services, um, then we, we can't necessarily partner with you. But if you're a larger organisation hiring over 100 people, we can partner with you over a 12 month period to help you look at all sorts of things to do with um, making you more confident to hire people with disability. Amazing. Thank you so much, Claudia. And yeah, I really like what you said about the inherent requirements and um, kind of goes back to what Lisa and Christine were talking about as well in relation to how important it is to review those position descriptions and really tailor them to the job. Um, and like you said, sometimes organisations may have something in a PD that's just been there for years and they've not really um, thought to take it out. So yeah, that um, is really important. And yeah, particularly your example around the driver's licence as well. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, Sophia, I'll move on to you next. Um, so in the first part of this session, we've learnt about inclusive and exclusive language from Lisa and Christine. Um, and from this, we can understand that different words can invoke different images and opinions, ultimately influencing who actually applies for a role. So Sophia, I was just wondering if you could provide some information about the type of language in job ads that might exclude or deter mature age job seekers from applying. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, before I do that, I just want uh, on Claudia's point to add around inherent requirements. One thing that we see that deters older people um, in that is heavy lifting. What does heavy lifting mean? And um, so is it 12 kilos? Is it 50 kilos? And so being really specific in the requirements of the role um, will help you attract older people as candidates as well um, in that aspect. But on language, uh, thank, you, thank you for Christine and Lisa. Uh, absolutely, language is so important. Uh, it is a, a key indicator of, uh, um, yeah, who, who is it that you're looking for? And words like fresh, energetic, dynamic, innovative, are all signals uh, to older people that we're looking for young people. And so really being thinking about who is it that you, that you, you want. Look, and the, I, I, I did the same thing, Christine, before I um, this session. I went and had a look at about 70 job ads um, Particularly on the platforms that lots of old, uh, lots of uh, not-for-profits will advertise on, which are lots in pro bono and ethical jobs, and about 70% of them had the word dynamic in them. And I'm thinking, what does that actually mean? Who are you? Who are you looking for? And it's not actually even helping you stand out. It's you're melting into the into the into the crowd. So, I think some of the best job ads I've seen have uh, been very honest about who they what, who they are and what they want. So what is it that makes your organisation attractive? Um, is it your achievements? You know, 
know, do you, is it, uh, what's the value that you add to in this, com in the community sector that our organisation finds homes for homeless people? Is that part of your attraction? Um, our organisation finds jobs. What, what is it that, what is it that's going to make you attract, attractive? What's the value proposition um, for the people? Is it outcomes, success, et cetera? So, I think one of the most honest pieces of recruitment I've seen in probably the last 10 years is from a major bank who said, you're smart, come and work with us uh, and you'll be very, very rich. However, you're not going to see your family for the next 10 years. I know that's not an ad that you're going to see in the community sector, but they were honest about what it is that that um, they're offering and to achieve success. Uh, in the local government sector, um, often elected officials are um, some, or and maybe in the community sector boards, uh, sometimes um, challenges. I've seen advertisements where they say our council is supportive or our board is supportive. So what's the message that you're um, sending? On the problem on age, um, some of the things that we people say that helps them to understand the role is, and that they it's going to be attractive is encouraging, send the signal, all ages are encouraged to apply or um, mature workers um, are encouraged are, are encouraged to apply. Um, I was recently having a conversation with a, a colleague uh, who was having a challenge in terms of recruiting to a position um, in the community sector and she says, well, I said, well, what is it that you really need? What would this position benefit from? And I said, well, we actually need somebody with some experience um, who knows their way around this sector. But what we're getting is applicants who are um, fresh out of university, not a lot of experience and expecting something from the role. So, it's a, so this is where it's important to tailor your language. And I said, well, if you're looking for somebody with the experience, why aren't you writing that in your PD, in your PD, and in your um, in your role um, in your job advertisement, and then sending the signal, mature applicants um, encourage mature mature applicants. There's nothing illegal, and this is what we get a lot of feedback we get from um, employers is well. I can't write that, that's illegal, that's discrimination. Well, it's not. It's actually what you're doing is encouraging and opening your um, your pool by encouraging all ages diversity to apply. And I think, Christine, that, that connection with your, um, your values and your diversity statement is really, really important um, to send as, as part of that. So, yeah, language, absolutely important. And sit back, have a think about what is this advertisement um, and what is my job at, um, what's the signal that it's sending to my future applicants? Thanks so much, Sophia, for that. Um, yeah, it, I really like your wording around all ages are encouraged to apply. It's really simple, you know, something that's easy for people to put in there, but um, can really be that turning point for a lot of people to realise that, you know, this is a job that, people are welcome to apply for of all ages. Um, and yeah, your comment around um, the types of language, like I think it links really well to what Lisa and Christine were saying around how those certain words um, can be used to attract a certain um, type of candidate as well. So um, they can be used, like they're not always used to exclude people, but they can be used to um, really target your recruitment to attract a certain candidate. So yeah, thank you so much. Anab, I'll move over to you now. Um, so in your experience working in the HR and diversity and inclusion space within the public sector, how do you think organisations can demonstrate a really authentic commitment to diversity and inclusion through the recruitment process, um, keeping in mind the intersectional identities that talented job seekers may present with? Um, wonderful, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Sarah and Nina, thanks for having me. Um, it's so good to see that um, um, the work that I've advocated, you know, position description shouldn't be done this way. Should be done, you know, way to make people, um, you know, to attract to 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 apply the roles. Um, Christine and Lisa, you've really demonstrated um, something I've been advocating, and I've actually done it practicality, and I've was able to. Um, 
reach target that I was given at the time while I was a HR manager and finance manager from my previous organization. Um, I'd like to start to say, uh, by saying that workforce inclusion actually needs to be a priority for all, not just the DNI team and not, not just those who have a good heart or, or, or been an ally. Organizations, I feel like, should advocate a greater representation of diverse workforce and create an inclusive workplace, which are free from bias, discrimination, um, uh, you know, ableism and all that, um, where cultural diverse or, or people with disability, you know, can bring their whole self to work and, and have access to, um, you know, have access to the right support for, and flexibility to perform their um, best, their best. Um, we organizations need to demonstrate, um, you know, that look at intersectionality, you know, you, you look at the table. If there's those who are missing at the table, we need to create, if particularly we need to know, um, you know, the demographic of our workforce, then we will, uh, then, then if we are missing, obviously we are missing certain um, groups at the table, we need to look at, you know, creating a special measures position um, to, uh, to give people a, a level playing field. At the moment, you know, I'm familiar with the public sector. We've got something we call merit process and the merit process assumes everyone has a level playing, uh, e everyone has an equal level playing field, but the reality, that's not the case. In my case, when I came to Australia, obviously English was, um, I, I spoke three languages, but English was my, was my fourth language. So every time I turn up to interview questions, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. And I really struggle, where do I start from the beginning to the end, in the middle? So actually we need to be kind of mindful that people don't have an um, equal level playing field. We have a still accessibility issue. Um, I remember turning up to interviews, I have a physical disability, where I, could, where I was interviewed underneath this test. And when I questioned, can I do the job if I'm successful underneath this test? And I was told, no, 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 you have to climb this test. So we still have that barrier that we need to overcome. I would really like to see organizations to look into that intersectionality or, you know, to, you know, to uh, attract um, talented um, job seekers is they need to really make sure that they provide a disability and cultural awareness training to their hiring managers um, so that, you know, and also offer unconscious bias, um, some cases anti-racism training um, to be really made compulsory for managers so that they are aware of their bias and where they're lacking. Um, I think we really, organizations need to focus implementing inclusive, um, you know, recruitment practices to remove the systemic barrier. We know there is a barrier there, but we really need to be actively removing those barriers by educating hiring managers to break down the notion of cultural fit as well, to move to the, you know, more more inclusive um, approach to cultural act. You know, if you're looking, if you're focusing on cultural fit, the dominant culture will always get that position. But um, I wouldn't, I was I usually missing out jobs because I didn't fit the cultural fit at the time because, you know, due to my number of intersectionalities that I have. Um, so I think we need to look at cultural, which helps, you know, organizations attract, um, you know, or recruit um, diverse workforce. Um, I've also really liked to see organizations in order to improve or to, you know, to authentically, you know, um, uh, practice their uh, commitment to in diversity and inclusion. They need um, offer interviews. We need to offer interviews to those who share the lived experience, or meet when they if they meet the minimum criteria of the role. I've actually practically done that, and I've amazed how much it really removed barriers for people. Even if they were not successful for that particular role, we were able to give feedback, and then they were able to you know um, have their next in um, interview opportunity. They were able to practice or implement those feedback because what can you improve if you're not getting even job interviews? Um, I like to see workplace adjustment being made. Um, for us in the public sector, I really don't like calling reasonable adjustment. People tend to think it was reasonable or not reasonable. So in my organization, I've made a commitment to say workplace adjustment. And I'd really like to see that to be made the norm rather than the exception. And it needs to start at the short listing stage because if you forefront and then tell people, okay, I'm, I'm calling you for an interview, uh, what do you like to, well, what sort of, adjust, do you like adjustment to, you know, is there any adjustment that you want me to bring but to be able to participate the interview process? If if you sort of come that way, like openness and encouraging, I think people will be able to, um, if they're successful, be able to share with you their, um, you know, to ask adjustment that they require because disability is not all visible and 90% are invisible um, disability. I've also like to see really organization is to, show their commitment by ensuring that, you know, when an interview is happening, there's, you know, the panel be diverse themselves. You know, I tend to respond myself better when I see someone sharing any of my intersectionalities at the interview table, whether it be an accent, whether it be a, you know, 
disability, whether it be a color, whichever might be the case. And I also like to highlight if I've got a few more minutes, um, you know, the benefit diversity brings. I think we need to focus that as well in terms of make diversifying our workforce. You know, having diverse workforce, it brings a fresh array of fresh array of perspective to the table, which can lead to a better decision making, problem solving and increased productivity. The community we are serving are diverse, so we need to diversify our workforce if we want to, you know, offer um, a, a service that, that is inclusive. It helps also as well create provision of equal employment opportunity and respectful workplaces, particularly where I come from, the state Victoria is so diverse, Australia as a whole, as a whole multicultural, but we also need to make sure that that diversity is represented within our team as well. Um, um, once, you know, um, we moved the, the time when BASIC was only the incentive people, to, you know, to get employment. I think uh, people are looking though, if this organization is, um, living their value, you know, if you have a diversity and inclusion, we value diversity, we, we value inclusivity. If we are saying that, it needs to be seen in our, not just enter uh, and not lower, uh, you know, low job positions. We also need to see that representation in a senior leadership to show that our commitment. Thank you so much, Anab. I like, um, I really love what you said. Um, your comment about workplace inclusion involving everyone is so true. It, you know, it's not something that should just um, live with the HR team or the DEI team. It really does involve everyone. Um, and I, I think what you said as well around people aren't just looking for the pay anymore. That's not the the sole driver. Like a lot of people these days, we find are looking for organisations that really align with their values. Um, and I think this particular space, um, this is so important for organisations to focus on, you know, the DEI space because um, it's something that candidates are really looking for these days. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're doing really well for time, so we might go for a second round of questions. <laughs> um, so, Claudia, I might start um, back with you again. Um, you touched on the clear and inherent requirements. Um, I just wanted to see, did you have any other um, advice to kind of provide to organisations around those workplace adjustments that may help people with disability? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, one of the, the first things that we sort of talk about when I contact employers, um, you know, sort of cold call organisations to talk to them about the services we offer is, um, you know, I often, you know, I often say, oh, you know, like it'll come up and they say to me, oh, yeah, you know, oh, well, we can't hire anybody with disability because we've got stairs. Um, and, you know, as it's already been alluded to, you know, actually that's not the cohort that we're, we're talking about. It's something like uh, less than 4.4% of people in Australia uh, who identify as having a disability use wheelchairs um, and it's like less than 2.2% worldwide or something like that. So, you know, as, as an I've already said, 90% of people with disability, um, those disabilities are invisible. You can't just see it by looking at it. So it's pretty likely that you're already hiring people um, with disability. So, you know, we're not just talking about um, when we're talking about workplace adjustments, we're not just talking about uh, ramps and lifts and widening corridors and things like that. Um, however, of course, you know, there is the Employment Assistance Fund there to help pay for workplace adjustments when you do need to make them. But, you know, most people with disabilities won't actually need any uh, physical adjustments to the workplace, but they might need some flexibility. So, um, you know, things like adjusting the, the time when people start um, or, you know, having breaks during their day, um, you know, all of those kind of things. And, and we're making um, adjustments for everybody in the workplace on a daily basis. So, you know, making them as for somebody with disability is just part of business as usual, or should be just part of business as usual. Um, but it, it might be how we provide communication. Um, so, you know, thinking about um, are we writing things down? Um, when we're, you know, having uh, meetings, you know, are we reading out what's on the screen? Um, are we providing notes to people that they can take away and read in their own time? Um, all of those things can really benefit everybody because everybody learns in different ways. So, you know, providing um, lots of different formats for people can be really helpful. Um, I just lost my train of thought. So, um, oh yeah, I was going to say also, um, no, it's gone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Come back to me later. <laughs> no worries at all, Claudia. No, that, that was really great what you said. I like 
um, the fact, you know, we are already making adjustments for everyone in a workplace. So um, those additional adjustments, yeah, like you said, should just be part of business as usual. And the thing I really like about this topic is that all of these things we put in place when it comes to creating an inclusive workplace culture is stuff that benefits everybody. So we're not just putting it in place to benefit a few people. It actually benefits everyone. You know, everyone benefits from, like you said, having different formats for learning or um, different ways of conducting meetings or like they're all things that benefit everyone. So I, that's why I really, really love this topic. Oh, has it come I, back to you? I remember my train of thought. Yes. Yeah, so awesome. um, the Employment Assistance Fund is can also, um, it's, it's very much geared around um, once you've got an employee with disability in mind, um, you know, it can actually also fund things like training for managers um, or, you know, other colleagues, for example, to better understand um, how to work with that person with disability in your organisation. Because, you know, sometimes managers' styles of communication isn't necessarily going to always align with um, what the employee actually needs. So, you know, providing a bit of training on both sides can actually, you know, help both the employee and the employer, you um, you know, better uh, interact with each other so that they can both get what they need. Thanks for that, Claudia. And yeah, definitely encourage everyone online to check out Job Access. They've got an awesome range of free resources, so much information on there, which is super helpful. So yeah, highly encourage everyone to do that. And, and that 1 800 get... number yes. is fantastic. Any, any questions you have, you know, if they can't answer it, um, they'll refer you to somebody who can and free. Free, free. Yeah, we love free <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Uh, Sophia, I'll, I'll go on to you next. Um, obviously, in the competitive job market of today, um, attracting talented job seekers can prove difficult for a lot of organisations. And I think a big part of an organisation's effort in you know, putting out an ad is about accurately conveying their mission, their culture, their values um, to assist in showcasing to job seekers what that organisation does. Um, so how, what are some ways that organisations can effectively convey their values, their culture and their purpose through their job ads and also through other mechanisms like their website? Yeah, so um, thanks, Sarah. I think um, you've hit the nail on the head that but people dry people are looking beyond the pay people are looking for purpose and uh, it's a real key driver um, and being able to connect with that or with your organization so the image that you put forward um, is really really important um, and at the front line your staff are part of that that image so um, if 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 you're I think uh, it was either Christine or Lisa said that you know if the person up there at the end of the phone uh, who answers the call about um, about the job doesn't know what it's about that's part that's putting people off already that they don't know what they're going on about so there's they're already that that disconnect so um, website is a really other a really important tool for showcasing Showcasing your organisation and the images on your website are really important in showcasing um, your organisation. So if the photographs on your website, if you're using photos, are not inclusive, uh, people can't see themselves, why would they come and work for you? So um, I know the people we talk to, they're looking for grey hair, they're looking for mature people who are working in the organisation. If they're not there, um, then um, then people don't see themselves in there. And I've seen moves, say, BHPs recently started changing the imagery on their website. They're including a lot more um, women. You saw that, that example about defence, that imagery. It's really important to see who... who who is there? What does your social media profile say about that? Um, have you got an organisation, a LinkedIn or Facebook? What's on that? What What's it uh, showing showing about you? Candidates are doing a lot of research before they um, even look at your organisation. They want to see that values uh, values alignment. Uh, and beyond that, if you get to that interview stage, are your managers? Uh, portraying confidence in terms of working with inter intergenerational workforces you know are they when they come to the interview can they are they comfortable with interviewing um, different people um, that that shows uh, in there um, 
the there was a conversation about policies as well. So the website is uh, an opportunity for you to showcase your um, in diversity policies and and then also connect them into your job description. Uh, if you've got clear markers, clear signals along that, and they're they're all connecting, that really makes a, a difference. The other thing I think you could consider thinking about is where do you advertise your your jobs? Uh, so we have uh, a number of um, portals now like pro bono and ethical jobs, and I'm not advertising for them at all, that send signals about the your values and what 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 it is your value. And the other thing I would say, the CEOs and leaders who are in on this call and listening to that, you have an opportunity to make decisions about how what you what you do and um, how you what's the signal that you're sending to your team and your staff. So in a previous role, uh, one of the things that I had a challenge with, and it's not about older people, it's more about gender and women returning to, to work. I had managers who were working to me who said, oh, she wants to come back part time. I said, and so what's the problem? Oh, this is not a part time job. I said, well, we're a very big organisation we should be making those changes. Is she a talented employee that we want to come back? Yes, yes. Okay, make it happen. And so are there signals that you can send as a, as a, as a leader in the organisation to your team to say, this is what's expected in our, in our workplace? We expect that we want, we want diversity, we want older workers, we want uh, women, we want uh, a diverse workplace. So they're the things that I'd be saying, you know, that your image and leaders have a role to play in um, sending those signals. Thank you so much, Sophia. I love your comment, make it happen. <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? Because so many things can easily be made happen. And um, the reality is in this job market, you want to keep those employees that are doing, you know, great work. So yeah, I really love that. Um, that really flows nicely into the final question I've got for you, Anav. Um, Workplace flexibility is really critical um, for diverse and innovative workplaces um, and highlighting these flexibilities into the position descriptions and job ads can also encourage diverse candidates to apply. So what are some ways that organisations can build more flexibility into the roles that they are hiring for? Um, lovely. Um, they can build on by adding, you know, um, saying this role can be done flexibly, you know, look, taking into account, you know, by offering that. Um, flexible work arrangements. So this will um, help, you know, attract um, diverse candidate. Um, as I said previously, you know, the the, the days that Bayjack was the only incentive to hold employment is long gone. So people will be feeling, you know, they might. This is really critically important because employee, uh, you know, potential candidates might um, would like to fulfill their other, you know, commitment. You know, either be parental responsibility or care responsibilities or pursuing further education, whatever might be their um, their interest, um, it will help them, you know, they offer flexibility, you know, they, they will be able to look at it. Um, I also like to share um, when uh, where, uh, a time where I offered a flexible work arrangements, not the person didn't have a disability, but um, he was he was a father recently separated from his partner and wanted to spend one of the weekdays, middle of the week, Wednesdays with his daughter. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Um, so when I facilitated that, you know, he didn't need to resign the job because he was saying to me, I'll have to look for a part time job. And I said, you don't need to look part time job. I can make this for a part time. And what really I did was I didn't backfill him that one day that he was able to take time off to spend his uh, to have some quality time with his daughter. Um, during the week, I didn't backfill him, but he was the highest performing in the team. He felt he was so satisfied. Um, he 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 brought himself hard to work. He felt that I valued. Um, he was he's been valued, and you know the, the he never had a deadline that he missed just by being away working for four days instead of five days. But imagine if I didn't allow that one, I would have lost him. And also, if he but if he didn't go, on, he wouldn't be able to to bring to him you know, his 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 home self to work. He wouldn't feel you know um, belonged into the team. Um, I think we can also do that, uh, you know, um, um, encourage um, flexibility in the position description by promoting or advertising the role as a job share. 
so that you know you know you'll have someone to share the job so you don't have to do if you didn't want to do full time um, we could also look at flexibility in terms of start time and ending time work arrangements. There are people might work for them due to their other commitments. They might start early and finish um, early. Depends on their circumstances. Um, also, um, and this can be done by when, when the job's been advertised rather than being the you know after third we could actually go for front. This job can be done. Uh, this job particular role can be done by job share, um, and we'll have uh, some flexibility that can be actually been incorporated into the. Um, advertisement. I think it's been touched before that, you know, also highlighting the importance of lift experience. I tend to respond to myself when I see organizations saying we're seeking for people with disability, cultural diverse welcome, Aboriginal welcome or refugee or other diverse elements. I've, I tend to respond to myself, um, you know, sort of well. So people will feel like they're not, the, they won't be the odd one if they apply this role. So having that flexibility built into the position description, I think it helps. I do remember while I was the HR manager for my previous organization, I was tasked to do, um, to increase disability employment by 20%. When um, the organization was new, it started, it was a commissioner, was was commissioned, was starting work, and the commissioner said, I want my staff member to be from people with lived experience because it was a disability organization. And the commission himself have a lived experience. So it doesn't have to depend on people to have a lived experience of certain things they're promoting. I think we can all be, um, you know, offering that, you know, uh, encouraging. And we were able to reach that for, um, percentage within within 12 months by modifying the position description, just putting all the inherent requirement, taking out all the other rubbish, um, giving him uh, managers um, disability awareness training, that was our target. And what I actually found that I was focusing on particular group, but actually other groups, you know, cultural diverse people were able to come through that, you know, that, um, you know, inclusive practice we were doing. Aboriginal stuff, we were able to come through, to, you know, through that, uh, you know, um, inclusive practice we, we implemented. So when you try to, work for one cohort, actually it does help the, the other cohort. I'd just like to add quickly, um, we all have a role to play in challenging bias as it can lead to, you know, as I said before, stereotype or discrimination, which can limit access to opportunities and leads to poorer societal outcome. We can overcome these barriers by expanding employment pathways to diverse candidates. We can invest in developing the capability of diverse employees we already have. From what, I, what I've noticed in the public sector, that's the only experience that I have, is that people tend to think people with disability are loyal, they stay in their positions. Uh, we all have as bias, you know, aspiration to move forward, but lack of accessible, accessible workplace, lack of profession develop, lack of talent, um, um, lack of, uh, not, not lack, but untolerated profession development, sometimes it, it's the one holds us, not our aspiration. Um, I really like to, um, you know, share that. Well, I'm confident that we can create positive and empowering workplace if we all walk the talk and look at the table to see who is not being represented. As a person with lived experience of many intersectionalities and HR background, I really like to ask everyone in this room today to encourage and educate your cycle of friends, families, manager, colleagues to consider hiring people with lived experience of um, intersectionality, whether it's a disability, whether whatever might be the case. They don't have to go hire and manage. They don't have to go out of their way. They just need to be a little bit flexible, open-minded, and provide the opportunity to those who deserve it the most. The fact of the matter is that employee with disability, employee with other, you know, intersectionality, different cultures or intersectionality, they are just as reliable as everyone else, and can and have a great of, um, you know, uh, and it's a great at problem solving and good for business. You know, diversity. Cases out there, so we're not create, we're not asking people to do something um, that's never been done. People with disability, particularly, are not coming from different planet. They're part of the society, and there's potential that they might be part of your team, but they're just not feeling, you know, um, culturally say uh, comfortably or share to to share their disability. Thank I'm you, Sona. To too long. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. <laughs> Totally fine. Thank you so much, Anav. Those are really great words to finish on. So thank you so much. And I just want to say a very big thank you to our panelists, Anab, Sophia and Claudia. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your insights with us today. It's been really, really useful um, to hear all your perspectives. Um, and thank you to Lisa and Christine for delivering the content today. Um, so you'll all see on your screen shortly um, an evaluation poll that will pop up. So we'd really appreciate if you could um, complete that poll to let us know how you found the session today. 
Um, and I just want to reiterate again that um, you will receive a post event email after this session. Um, you'll receive all the um, links to everything we've spoken about and you'll, you'll also receive a copy of the PowerPoint and also the resource that's been developed. So um, we've got a resource that we'll be sending you, which is um, a position description template and also a job advertisement template as well. So you'll receive a copy of that. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you again for joining us and we really hope to see you for our next session, which will be on Tuesday, the 23rd of April, and that will be on the topic of finding the candidates you're looking for. So thank you everyone. Thanks again to our wonderful speakers today and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone. Bye.